Here you go. Okay, brother. I love you. Appreciate you and your wife. Yes. Feel the spirit of God here. Come on. Yeah. Amen. We're in a tent That's out in the middle yeah. of nowhere, and That's God's exactly here. Right. Yeah. Amen. That's <laughs> like great. Yeah. He goes with us. That's awesome. I love I love being in the midst of uh, people who obviously are people of the spirit too. You know, um, you can just feel it in the atmosphere. There's sort of a. It's interesting that the scripture that that was highlighted to me tonight. I'll get to in a minute. But it's, it's out of the Book of Acts, and, and um, you know this this church was birthed by the Holy Spirit. It wasn't just wasn't just, uh, you know, I know you got a history with another movement and all that, but, but you can feel the Spirit of God and the presence of God in, in you as a people, and that's awesome to be in the midst of that. So, I, I, like John was saying, you know, I think a lot of us are, are looking at Oregon to burst forth in, into revival. Before he um, laid it down and was there 22 years in the largest church in town, the Assembly of God Church in, in uh, Albany. Wonderful man of God. He actually turned down being superintendent of the district to stay there and then kind of got pushed out. It was a really strange deal. But we prayed together a couple of times a month. And this whole issue of unity came up in one of our conversations as we were praying. And he said this. He said, I wish I could just get one family in unity. Amen. <laughs> And, you know, he actually was on to something. Because God has a dream. And we're always talking about our dreams, my dream. And we even write books, that, you know, people write books about how to find your dream and all this stuff today. And it seems like it's all about me in the body of Christ today, you know. But, actually, God has a dream. God the Father... Yeah. has a dream that he would have a great big family like his son Jesus. Right. That's God the Father's dream. That's right. He wants a huge family like his son Amen. Jesus. Amen. When he said, we've made you in our image, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he was talking about the image of Jesus. That's what he was talking about. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so he was talking about the image of Jesus. Now I, I realize he can be interpreted in lots of different ways, but honestly, I think when I look in the Bible, I look for two things. Did, did Jesus and the apostles both teach and practice it? If it is, I can drive a stake in the ground about that, you know, and say, that's what I want to do. I'm not saying people shouldn't do other things, and they can conceptually, you know, come up with a, a support for, for what they're doing. But for me, I, I want to practice and teach and do those things that Jesus and the apostles practice in Christ. And um, if we're actually going to come into unity, this whole issue of family is a lot bigger thing than we think. Before I share with you an encounter I had in 2006 in Brazil, which really grabbed me about this, let me just say about our nation, what's happening in our nation is obvious that the whole strategy for tearing this nation apart is to tear the family apart. At the very deepest level, you know, of even identity for people, as well as, you know, breaking families up, kids are not valued with abortion, all that kind of stuff. But, and the thing is, is we're not to judge what's going on in terms of judging the people. You can't expect people who don't know God to live godly, you know. But at the same time, we have a real challenge on our hands, and this is, this is what I really feel. If we want to see... Um, Unity in the body of Christ. If we want to see our country come back into unity, which our nation really needs, it's very divided. It's just divided right down the middle. It's, it's this whole us against them thing, and it's not good. 
In fact, as Christians, we, we should just, the word repent means change your mind. Very first thing is change your mind and then change your ways. But the very first thought process we need to change is that whole us and them thing about our country. And about people who don't know Christ. Because there's only two kinds of people in the world. There are those who are in the beloved and those who just don't know it yet. Yeah. Yeah. And I, that's not a statement about universal salvation. It's a statement about the fact that Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. And so everybody needs to know. And they get an opportunity to make a choice at, at that point. But there are a lot of people, and I used to think that everybody would heard the gospel in America, but it's just not true. When we got out on the streets and got outside the four walls of the church, we began to realize that most of the people that we talked to didn't know what the gospel was at all. And in fact, I did a lot of schools over the last decade and a half, and I, I would ask every school that I would do, whether it was our school or somebody else's school, what is the purpose of being born again? What, why are we born again? What's the purpose of being born again? And I'll just save you the embarrassment. Ah, thank you. Most, you know, most people would say, so my sins would be forgiven. So that I could know God. So that, um, you know, uh, I could understand the cross. All these kinds of things, you know, which are not wrong. But Jesus' own words were so that you could see the kingdom. That's right. Yeah. Unless you are born again, you cannot see ever the kingdom of heaven. And once your heart is awakened and your spirit is awakened and you can see spiritually, you have an opportunity to make a choice about Jesus and the kingdom. But until your heart is awakened that way, you don't. So, this is dangerous. I don't necessarily equate being born again with the forgiveness of sins. The reason is because Jesus didn't. He later on said about the cross, that's where we get the forgiveness of sins. Okay. The blood of Jesus. Uh -huh. Having your spirit awakened doesn't necessarily forgive your sins. Not unless you make a decision to receive it. And enter into it. And step right into this whole realm called the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. And so it's an invitation. But um, we have a lot of folks who really don't know anything, even in the church, about what it means to be born again. And yet we want to, and yet we want to have unity in the whole church. Yeah, right. You know? And it's not about that we agree, you know, what I just said probably tweaked some of you out. It's not that we just agree doctrinally. It's not really about agreeing doctrinally. As I'm saying doctrine is important. Theology is important. We'll see that in a second. But what's really important is relationships. And, what, and the reason that we have such a hard time reaching people outside the church is we don't have a relationship with them. Yeah. 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 We expect to have them come to us. And I'm not just talking about going out to preach the gospel. I'm talking about even making friends. Sure. Right. Yeah. Jesus went to Peter's mother-in-law house and she had a fever and so he, he laid, you know, I don't know if he just spoke a word or laid hands on her. She was healed. Yeah. Peter's like, Man, maybe I will follow this guy. <laughs> Here's my point in that. Jesus discipled people before they were born again. Before they were ever born again. And we know that because they weren't born again until they were walking with him on the road to Emmaus. It's really the same story in Luke chapter 24 and in, in John chapter 20 where one, one says, you know, oh... Didn't our hearts burn within us as he opened up all the scriptures to us? Their eyes were open. Yeah, yeah. Then in John 20 it says, it says he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden they understood. Right. Same thing. That's right. And all that time leading up to it, for three years they were with Jesus and they weren't born again. How do you know that? 
Jesus would tell them about the kingdom. He'd tell them about the cross. He'd tell them he's the Messiah. They're like, I don't get it. What are you talking about? He's like, oh, you have little understanding and faith, you know. Don't you get this yet? Yeah. No, they didn't get it yet. And then the Holy Spirit came in power. And they received power on the day of Pentecost. And I want to read to you um, from Acts chapter 3. This is Peter's second sermon after they had healed the man at the gate beautiful and it created all this stir. They demonstrated the kingdom of heaven right out in the right out in the open in front of the temple with a guy that Jesus probably walked by several times. I mean that's obvious too. He went first to the house of Israel, so he had to have walked by this guy. He said he was always there at the gate. Why didn't he heal him? I don't know. This was left, maybe this is one of those greater works that was left for the disciples. But Peter preaches this great sermon, and then we come down to Acts 3.20. Uh, 320, after he tells them what they should do, which is repent and turn around so their sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing can come from the presence of the Lord. Then he says this, and that he may send to you the Christ, the Messiah, who before was designated and appointed to you, even Jesus, whom heaven must re receive and retain. I'll read from the Amplified, the wordy version. Until the time of complete restorations of all that God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets for uh, ages past, from the most ancient time in the memory of man. I want to key in on two, two things here. <clears throat> one, one is he said, heaven must retain Jesus until a chrono, say time. time. And that means a long time or a short time, when you look it up. It could be a short time, it could be a long time. Heaven must retain Jesus for either a short time or a long time until this restoration of all things that were spoke by the mouth of the prophets from times past. What the heck is that? I thought, when I, I used to read this verse, and I thought that was just about the second coming of Christ only. But it, it actually say, it says that one of the purposes of Jesus was to come and restore. Mm -hmm. He said, the, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me in, in Luke 4.18. Right. And, I, I, and the reason that He's anointed me is to heal the brokenhearted, to restore sight to the blind. Yeah. And restoration is a big, was a big part of His ministry. To restore people from the effects of the fall. Amen. And when you look at this, you know, actually dig this out theologically, that's what it actually says, is to actually set up a theocracy that looks more like what God had in mind before the fall. Right. And it actually says that it might take a long time or it might take a short time. And we focus on only on Jesus coming in the clouds, which we know that He will. We know that He's going to set this kingdom up, and it's going to, and that He's coming in the clouds the same way that He left. And I believe all all of that stuff, the catching away, the whole thing. I believe all that. But in the meantime, Peter and John were doing what Jesus told them to do, yeah. which is go restore. Now I want to tell you a little story. I, I uh, John can appreciate this. I, I had a really awesome salmon boat that was pretty new, and I felt like God spoke to me and said, "Sell this boat. You've got." I had an invitation from Wesley and Stacy Campbell to go help with a school they were doing in Brazil in São Paulo, and they were doing the call Brazil, which was leaders from all over Brazil and a young lady was setting this up for them and I felt like he said sell your boat and get money and take a team with you and go to this so I did 
And so we went to Argentina first and did some ministry in Argentina, went to Claudio Friesen's church, that was amazing. It's a church of 25,000 people. Get this, I mean, this is what revival will look like someday. Um, you know, they started outside the church, and I, I realized that it started with stadium-type ministry and evangelism. However, that doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to start the same way here. Because we've had that, and it hasn't really produced revival. I'm not saying that it's, that it's not good, it's just that it hasn't produced revival and awakening in the nation. But when Carlos and Anacondia did this, then it died out, but they had some unity among seven pastors. Interesting. Seven pastors came together, started praying together, started working together, and the revival seemed to begin to wane, and then all of a sudden another wave hit. And part of it was, and I visited this prison, that almost all the prisoners had gotten saved in the, the prison that was outside of Buenos Aires. And we, we went and visited that prison. It was not unlike any other prison I've ever seen. It's like family members would come and eat with the prisoners. They'd have a worship service every day and a Bible study every day. <laughs> and right. a prayer meeting that went most of the night. <laughs> and they prayed for this revival to kick in and just keep going wave Hallelujah. after wave. And here it came again. Uh -huh. This time it hit the churches. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and... When it hit the churches, it really shook the churches. Um, I was a part of a, a, a prayer meeting group that was evangelical, mostly evangelical driven down in our valley. And at one point, the high point, there was probably 40, 50 churches involved in this. It was, af it was actually started just before the renewal. And... Um, they knew about what was happening in the renewal and everything, and but they didn't really like it, most of them. <laughs> but the, the leader of the movement was filled with a spirit, you know, kind of under the radar. <laughs> and so I had a guy of one of these seven pastors visiting from, from southern Argentina, Marcelo Marioni, and he came over and we were doing meetings and I said, hey, if you would like him to explain to all the pastors what revival looks like in Argentina, why don't we have him come to one of the meetings? And he said, that's a great idea. So probably 30 guys showed up. And th this is the question. They said, when the revival hit the churches, uh, how did it start and what did it look like? And so he told you what I told you up to this point. But then when it hit the churches, he said it looked like Toronto. Uh Huh. That didn't go over very well. <laughs> <laughs> At all. <laughs> and one of the guys in the meeting said, you know, and I respected all these guys, still do, but this guy said, well, isn't that kind of divisive, all that stuff? You know, the manifestations and all the things that are happening yeah. in that, and we'd already been called on the carpet once, you know, and and for the meetings we were doing, and we were trying to be very careful not to disrupt other churches, but people were hungry. Yes. Yes. So we'd say, don't go back and try to change your church. Don't go back and try to, you know, drive a stake in the ground about what just happened to you. Just enjoy this and let God change you. Yes. Yes. And so, anyway, um, he said that one of the guys that said this, made this statement, or asked this question, he said, isn't that stuff kind of divisive? And Marcelo said, no, actually what's divisive is quenching the Holy Spirit. There you go. Yes. 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 He just boldly said it. Yeah. He right. said, so much so that he said, I'll tell you what happened. He said, all the churches that embraced the move of the Holy Spirit grew exponentially. In every way, and miracles broke out. Yes. Gold teeth, all kinds of things. Like I said, uh, Carl, um, uh, Claudio's church is 25,000 people, and they have like five services on Sunday, and not everybody gets in. You wait in line outside downtown, and if you're lucky, you get into one of the services. Otherwise, you come and try again next week. 
and the glory of God is in every one of these services. And so he said, but what happened to the churches that rejected the move of the Spirit, they all dried up and just, you know, just withered away. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting, huh? Yeah. See, we have something sort of different going on here where, where um, this, you know, we're kind of watered down gospel, um, you know, it's all about me. I hope I'm not offending anybody, no, you're but right. you're right. you know, it's all about me and, and all that kind of stuff. I'll beat up on us before we're done. So, you know, if you're thinking about, oh, it's those guys. Yeah. So anyway, uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But no, I'm not really. But anyway, so. <laughs> but here, that's what grows in America. It's, it's what, it's a consumer mentality. It's like, I need a smorgasbord of this, I need a program for that, and if you don't have it, I'm not going to your church, and then I'll go to the one down the street if they have it, and all that kind of stuff, and if you make me mad, then I'll go away, and I'll go to the down one, because there's lots more churches I can go to anyway. It's not like China where you get killed. I mean, I can just go anywhere I want. So, you know? So it's a little different in the U.S. It's kind of like flipped, but... That time's about to change. Yes, it is. Amen. Because Amen. what's happening in the country and the shaking that's happening is really setting us up for the greatest move of God yes. in the history of the Hallelujah. USA. Amen. It really is. And I don't believe you need persecution. I don't believe you, you believe you need earthquakes and all that stuff to have a move of God. I don't believe that at all. But however, I think what is happening is causing people to say, is there any is there an answer anywhere? All the things I was depending on don't work for me anymore. I can't depend on the government. I can't depend on my job. I can't depend on my stuff. You know? So I went to Brazil. Like this is a long way there, wasn't it? I went to Brazil. My wife says I, I do that all the time. But she's not here to to, you know, like redirecting, so. <laughs> when I went to Brazil, um, we were we had this great school of supernatural and hundreds of people were getting saved in the malls and God was really moving in the school and then, and we went, had this, uh, the, the call, which was really just a one night thing, 9,000 people, mostly leaders from all over our uh, Brazil were there, you know, not just, this was like major leaders, and they said the father of revival in Brazil, who's actually from Ohio, a guy named Dan Duke. Um, he uh, he was there, and and so uh, it was just an amazing time. And at the end of that, we were supposed to go preach in a church. You know, Wesley and Stacy were going to go preach in a Pentecostal church, and they said. We'd like you to go preach in a Catholic church. And I was actually excited about it because it was like, I've never preached in a Catholic church. I didn't know I could. You know? And so I was thinking, you know, like cathedral, like over in Italy. Yeah, I've been to Italy. I've been to England. I've been to France. I was thinking like cathedral type stuff, you know. And so we get in a, and, and so Wesley and Stacy said, who wants to go to the Catholic church and who wants to go to the Pentecostal church? All the young people wanted to go to the Catholic Church with us. I was like shocked. We're standing outside of this place where we ate, and we're praying before we go, and the Holy Spirit just rocks us. And I'm like, man, what is going on? We get on the bus, we're singing, speaking in tongues all the way, and I thought it was just not that far away. It was an hour and a half outside of town, and we go up through these mountains, and we start coming down into this village. And as we come down into this village, a scene opens up like from the Gospels where Jesus, you know, it says he looked upon the multitudes and he was moved with compassion. And I was, I was literally moved with the compassion of Jesus as I viewed. I could see drug deals. I could see fights. I could see prostitution, you know, even in the, just in the natural, just everywhere. It was a mess. It was just, it was terrible what was going on. And you could just see that, that the whole place was just like chaos. And this is where we were going into. So we come, and this, this Catholic church is actually a warehouse. And the, the, the guy that's the priest is like 35 years old. And he's just dressed like us, you know. 
And so the first thing I did was I asked him to bless me, and that kind of confused him, but he did. I just felt like I was supposed to do that before I, I could speak in his church, and so he did. And, but on the way down, when I, had, when I was moved with this compassion, I, it's only twice in my whole life I've ever heard the audible voice of God. And the first time was when he called me into ministry. But th I, I did. I heard the audible voice of God say this. Now, you'll just have to let this sink in. The key, he said, Denny, the key to revival is the restoration of family. But think about it. I mean, when that hit me, it hit me like a ton of bricks, but I didn't know what it meant. I was like, really? <laughs> I thought the outpouring of the Spirit was. I thought, you know, like the miracles. I thought, like, preaching. I thought something. I thought any, you know, I n never would have thought something like that. <laughs> but there was the audible voice of God, and it went into me. And so we get into this place, and there's like three, 400 people in there, and they're sitting Actually, they were they're sitting in those white plastic lawn yeah. chairs, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And um, they introduced me, and, I, and the atmosphere is pregnant with the, the, the presence and the glory of God. And, and I, I'm kind of stunned. I, I really don't even know what I'm going to do. Yeah. And I get up and I just say, you know, I'm not really sure why we're here. But I said, the one thing I know is that God wants to restore your family, and the people stood up and cheered. Wow. Yeah. They started clapping and cheering. Wow. Yeah. And I was just shocked. I'd never seen anything like it before. And so I all of a sudden I get words of knowledge, and, and the, the key one was that there are, there's a couple of women here, at least. In fact, I think there, there are more than that that have sexually transmitted diseases, and I was thinking young, you know, but I said, if you will be brave and come up here, God will heal you, and it'll, it'll just set the tone for the whole rest of the meeting. Mm -hmm. Two elderly women walked up with help, wow. and I don't know how old they were, but one of them was really old, and um, they both had AIDS, mm -hmm. and that's what I was told, they both had AIDS. And the one woman was blind. She, she couldn't see. She was legally blind. They led her up by the hand. The other woman was so emaciated, she looked like she could die at any time. She was just ash and white, you know, just frail, very skinny, hardly any meat on her bones. And she was just like ready to go, it looked like. And so we all prayed, and both of them got instantly healed. And when, it, and when that happened, pandemonium broke out in the whole place. That was the end of my preaching right there. It was like pandemonium broke out, and I just released the students and the team to pray for people. And I, I've never seen anything like it. It was just like a, a you know, just a, uh, an explosion of something and people going all over the place. And then all of a sudden I heard the screams coming from somewhere. And so I went back, and I, I came off the platform, and I went back, and I'm like, where is that? And then I went around the corner, and there she was. There's this girl on the ground, and the Brazilians had her in a headlock. They were pulling her hair. They were screaming at her and, you know, had her stretched out. You know, I, I suppose that initially she was kind of violent or something, but, you know, and she's making all kinds of, of you know, noises and everything. And, and I just, for a second, you know, I just... Like, what's going on? You know, I just locked in what's happening here, Lord. And, and then again, that compassion came over me. And I went over and I, I said, uh, let her go. And the interpreter, you know, said, let her go. And they were like, what? You can't let, you know. And so I said, no, let her go. And so they backed away and I got down on my knees and I asked her her name. And I told the demons to shut up. I said, what's her name? She goes, Leah. And then she hissed at me, and I just said, shut up. And then I said, okay, Leah. And I said, you're going to be okay. Hallelujah. And I turned to the, to the Catholic priest, and I said, do you know this girl? And he said, oh, yeah, everybody knows her. I said, really? I said, is she part of the Catholic Church? No. She comes in and out of here sometimes, but she belongs to a sexual cult. I hope I'm not being too graphic, but, but she, 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 gets, she gets raped every day. And she belongs to this cult. That's why she was demonized, you know. And I, and I turned to him and I said, did you ever think 
to tell her about the love of Jesus and lead her to Jesus and, and tears filled his eyes and said, no, I didn't. And I said, let her go. And everybody just backed away and then uh, Carrie Green's mom, the, the young gal that set up the call and everything, took her aside. The next thing I, I talked to somebody and when I turned around she was just weeping in her arms and she was so, she just got totally free just giving, giving Jesus in her life. And I came away from that meeting, I'll never forget it. That word, the key to revival, is the restoration of family. Amen. has stuck with me and has just like gotten bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger in my understanding of what it means. That it, that it actually pertains to the nuclear family, it pertains to the body of Christ, and it pertains to our nation, and it actually pertains to whole people groups and tribes and tongues around yeah. the earth. Yeah. Yeah. And that this is what God wants to do before He comes. He didn't say just, you know, and this is not a knock on what we've been doing about the script and all that. He didn't say just get people to pray a prayer. He said, make disciples That's it. That's right. of all nations. Yeah. He wants us to actually disciple yeah. nations. Yeah. We can't disciple nations until we model family. Yeah. The body of Christ must come into unity with itself and show what true family is to make the world jealous. We are being ripped to shreds as to what the idea of family is and going and scolding right. people and telling people you can't do this and you can't do that who are blind That's true. Yeah. Yeah. by the God of this age. Their minds are blinded by the God of this age. They're not going to hear it. But I'll tell you what, when they see functional family That's true. Right. and they see real love and real relationship that works, yeah. mm -hmm. that produces fruit, that is prosperous, that is able to have miracles yeah. surrounding yes. it, yeah. you know, the, the structure and everything. When they see that from, from the nuclear family to the governmental structure and divine order Amen. of the church, yes. they're going to they're gonna run to the church. Hallelujah. And that's what we really need. Now I uh, I had some questions I wrote down. Um This, this scripture where it says uh, um, until the restoration of all things actually does mean a, a perfect theocracy someday. Now we know that won't be complete until Jesus comes. But on the way, our work is to do His work. And He came to restore. Yes. He came for restoration. And so our work is restoration. It's not judgment. There, there shouldn't be any us and them. Let me just put it this way. If Jesus has, if all judgment has been given to the Son of Man, how much does that leave for you and me? All right. That's good. All. All means all. Unless you live in Texas, then it might mean oh, some, yeah. something you pour in your truck. Yeah. But, but, <laughs> but all means all. Now, I'm not talking about us, you and I, looking at certain things, behaviors, and saying, judging with our mind, not in a way that has emotional stuff attached to it, but just saying, that's, that's not right, that's not righteous. That's unrighteous, that's, that's right. evil. That's right. Yeah. That's that's a different kind of judgment. Right. right. But the final judgment, which is condemnation, which writes people off yeah. and says, yeah. You're that forever. That belongs to nobody but Jesus. Right. Yes. Amen. Right. right. Thank God I don't have that job. Yeah, that's yeah. It. Right. I don't even have to worry about that. Right. Right. That's why, you know. I may not condone, I, no, not may not, I don't condone homosexuality right. and things like Correct. that, but I can love Absolutely. a homosexual. Yeah. I can be a friend right. Yes. Right. to somebody who believes in that lifestyle 
and show them the love of Jesus and heal their diseases and, you know, be a friend to them, actually. It's like, oh, I couldn't be the friend. I might get cooties. <laughs> you know? I'm just picking one thing, you know. Whether it's that or it's something else, you know, or it might even be somebody's political point of view. You know, well, if I get too close to that, I might start thinking that way. <laughs> Not if you keep your nose in the Word of God. How are you going to change them? Yeah, how are you going to change them from your own interaction? Yeah, we, we don't have any kind of relationship. And there are different levels of relationship for right. sure. That's true. Right. Now, people love to say this anymore. You know, it's like, no longer do I call you servants, but now I call you friends. People in the charismatic movement especially love to say this, of which I'm a part, you know. But they forget that Jesus is a servant, and he's, they were servants first. And he said this, too. He said, he said, be my friend if you do what I tell you to do. <laughs> That's a condition. It's like, oh, that kind of friendship. Not just like casual buds or, you know, like, how are you, bud? You know? There's a lot of that kind of stuff, and so our expectations, now I'm, now I'm going to try to talk about us, to get us in unity. How do we get us in unity in the body of Christ? Because really, we hold the answer. We hold, we hold the, 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 this key to restoration. We hold this key to revival in our hands, in our hearts. We hold it as a church. Jesus builds a church. We don't build the church. We don't save anybody. Right. We're just messengers. That's we just it. show and tell. We just love. Amen. But, and Jesus does the saving. The Holy Spirit draws yeah. people to yeah. the Father. We don't do it. That's right. But at the same time, we, we have a part in this to play. And now a lot of that has to do with the way that we interact with each other. And this is where it gets down to Okay, it's great to think about the, the broader unity of the body of Christ. And I meet people, it's like, well, I don't belong to any church. I just belong to the whole body of Christ. Yeah. Right. And all that, all, that is to, all that is to me is like you got hurt sometime. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you really don't want to really get that close to anybody because you're, you're a recluse or whatever. But and you have your own opinions that are too strong and you know too much for the rest of us. But... <laughs> That's all that means to me. But we do want to see broader unity in the body of Christ. But if we don't even start within our own ranks, how are we going to get there? And so I've got a few questions. Uh oh. The first one is how do we look at others in and out of the church? When you, when you think about the people that are around you right in this room that you know, how do you view them? Paul said, I don't know anybody after the flesh any longer, but only by the Spirit. In other words, the Spirit is the heart, same thing as the heart. It's really the heart of the person and God's perspective about what He sees about that person, which is only good. God sees a good future and a hope for every person. Right. Yeah. Right. He wants nothing but the best for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He works all things together for the good, for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. And if He's for us, who can be against us? Right. So if He's for us, how can we be against a brother or sister in the right. church? Right. And so the way we think about that, and, the way, and I have to really work at this, personally. I mean, I'm 64, but I still have to really work at this. And stop myself and go, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You know, that, that that's just judging a book by its cover or whatever. It's like you don't even know that person, really. And see, there's this expectation in the body of Christ that everybody should be our close friend. It's an unreasonable expectation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This will get you. <laughs> How many of you heard of the story of Jonathan David? Yeah. Yes. It says that Jonathan loved David with a love that was stronger than death. More than he loved any other person. 
the word for love there, and I don't remember the Greek word but it, or the Hebrew word, but it's different than any other word for love. Mm -hmm. And you know what? It's a mixture of idol worship, of, you know, sort of a sensual type love, and a friendship love. Now, I'm not saying there was any sex involved. I'm just saying it's, a, it's not a good kind of love. And yet you hear people saying, man, I wish I had a friend like Jonathan had with David. Mm. Well, you know what? It cost him his life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I guess if you're willing to lay down your life for somebody, well, that's one thing for that kind of friendship. Mm. But the expectation that everybody you meet in church has been in church for a few years is your close buddy is an unreasonable yeah, expectation. Is. Yeah, right. What is reasonable is that they're your family. There you right. go. And that Amen. we are in covenant together as family. Good. That's Amen. reasonable. That's right. That's right. That's good. And it has a whole different meaning and everything behind it, which I can't go into sure. tonight. You can do that later okay. if you want to, John. <laughs> but, but, you know, yeah. I'm creating, I hope I'm not creating yeah, a big mess for you here. But, <laughs> but the thing is, it's like, we can't expect because brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, mm -hmm. you know, it's the family of God. That's right. That is a reasonable expectation. And actually, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, co it's a covenant, not a written thing. It's, it's something that's, that brought to us together because the same blood runs through our veins. There you go. Right. We're all J. Uh, C positive. Yeah, right. You know, all of us are J C positive, and so that's our blood type, and so it makes us all related together. And sometimes families squabble and this and that, you know, and sometimes we're dysfunctional. But in the end, it's like, no, we're family. That's it. You know, that's reasonable. That's right. So that's that's how we got to look at each other. The second question is, how offendable are we? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus actually warned about the end times. He said offenses will come like crazy. Yeah. Going to be lots of opportunities to be offended. But he said, woe to those who they come by. And he said, don't be offended. Don't, don't let that settle into you. Because if you, if you don't guard your heart, which all the issues of life flow from and you get offended and something lodges in there it's going to trip you up and probably a lot of other people too if it turns into a root of bitterness let me tell you a story and this just happened in our own fellowship i'm just telling on us we had something going on and, and actually god told me a year ago to start celebrating some of the families that were moving away well you know we're still an apostolic resource center but mm -hmm. You know, people had come to us thinking that that's all we were is, was a conference center. Mm -hmm. And we have a mission and a vision that we were sent to Albany for. And we've always said that. And so yeah. people would come, you know, and, and they'd have these expectations and all this kind of stuff. And, and then we, we would host things and some people would get worn out, you know, mm -hmm. and they would feel like they were not as valuable as the people that would come and all that kind of stuff. And, and so... <clears throat> We tried to, to uh, heal that stuff up for the last several years, but then, then families started and, uh, moving away because we were praying for families to be restored, and they would move to towns where their family was, and they'd get restored. Oh, wow. And so, but all, God told me to celebrate all that. But in the midst of that, because seats were empty now that used to be filled with so-and-so, people were like, what's wrong? Uh -huh. What's wrong? Right. There's something yeah. wrong, you know? And so at one point, this prayer group got together, and I didn't even know about their people who really love us, care about us. There's like five different families. They started getting together and praying. And they, did, they, had, they had no kind of bad agenda. They were just like, love the church. Let's just pray about this and, and see if God will turn this around, you know? And one of the guys had a vision of a Super Bowl bouncing around inside the church. Uh, and it, it would hit some people, and it would, and if it would hit them, um, it would bounce off of them, they would get discouraged. Uh, but if they caught it, they would not only get discouraged, but they would get offended, and then uh, they would go and give it to somebody else. Uh, 
Uh, you see the picture? Yeah. yeah. And we knew we were having this trouble communicating. And so we thought it was just about communication, you know. And so we kept trying to communicate this and over-communicate that. And it didn't change anything. <laughs> it's like, you know, we, we just recently just had somebody say, save some money and forget about the buttons. They just end up on the floor anyway. You know, it's like, like it's on the screen. It's on the way.